The first reading today is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and can be found on page 192 in the Pew Bible. Listen for the word of the Lord. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course in this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of our great love which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which prepare beforehand to be our way of life. The second reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, and can be found on page 93 in your pew Bible. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believed in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let us turn to God in prayer. Take all of the words of our mouths, take all of the thoughts and the meditations of our hearts, take them all, O oh God, and make them yours. Touch them with your grace, with your love, with your mercy, and transform us into the people you have created us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. During this uh, season of Lent, we are reflecting here at Lewinsville on what it takes to cultivate a heart of mercy. Cultivating hearts of mercy is the theme of this year's uh, Lenten devotional, um, that spectacular booklet. Uh, that has been developed by members of this congregation, copies of which are still available in the front hall if you haven't gotten one yet. And Cultivating Hearts of Mercy is the work to which we are summoned during this Lenten season. And I suppose that there may be some people who would think that having a heart of mercy sounds easy and sweet and nice, 
but I take it that keeping your heart open and merciful in our world of violence and division and scorn, that is demanding for all of us. When we look to our two texts today from Ephesians and John uh, that Carol read, and as Carol was saying uh, before uh, the service, these two texts present about as clear and concise a communication of the core of the gospel as you're likely to find in a pair of texts. When we look at these two texts today for their perspective on what's involved in developing lives of mercy, these two texts suggest that there are two ingredients which must be present for us to cultivate hearts of mercy, and those two ingredients are humility and trust. Humility and trust. If we are not intentionally seeking after humility and trust, having hearts of mercy will be harder and harder and harder for us. And our world is in rather desperate need of humility and trust today, and our world is hungry for people who are humble and trusting, especially, I think, here in our D.C. area. Our area is starving for people who practice humility and trust. And that can be one of the great gifts that you as a congregation can offer to this area. There is so much cynicism and self-importance among us. It's so easy to fall into those. Humility and trust are enormously counter-cultural practices for the church because the culture does not encourage these postures in the world. In the letter to the Ephesians, Paul, or possibly one of Paul's disciples who may have written the letter, describes the way that the Ephesians have been brought over from death to life, how they have been saved. And the essential point that Paul wants to make here is that their saving was not due to anything that the Ephesians themselves have done. You were dead through your trespasses and sins. All of us once lived among them, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Now, that sounds a little harsh. But Paul is not trying to beat up on his listeners here. Paul, after all, includes himself in the we who were living like dead people. Paul is acutely aware of how easily we humans can slip into disdain for other people. As I was thinking about this this week, I've come to think that disdain and scorn are like shape shifters because the forms that they can take seem to multiply and have no end. So a brief sample of the forms that this name can take would include, well, I'm smarter than those people. We're more sophisticated than they are. I'm nicer than those people. We're more down to earth than they are. I've got better music taste than you. Oh, he's such a snob. Those fans, this one you'll hear increasingly in the next couple of weeks, those fans are complete idiots. Anybody who would vote for that person is a moron. And so on and so on and so on. There are industries that make billions of dollars off of disdain and cutting people down. Disdain has been made into an art form. Whenever we are disdaining people, our hearts of mercy will have been turned off. And Paul in this passage wants to cut off 
every form of disdain at the knees. You were dead through your trespasses and sins, but even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. No matter who we are, we were dead. No matter which political party we belong to, we were dead. No matter what church we go to, we were dead. And then he goes on. You have been saved by grace through faith, and this is not your own doing. This is not your own doing. This is the gift of God, not the results of works. And then this is this wonderful little tagline. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So that no one can boast. Now, I think this is a hard word for us to take because we like to brag. We like to receive credit for what we have done. We like to be recognized as awesome. We like to receive awards for good behavior. But the gospel is not a reward for good behavior. Nobody gets to boast about being saved because salvation is the free gift of God given to us when we were good as dead. God is awesome like that. So the first ingredient in a merciful heart is to cultivate humility. And it seems somewhat evident that nothing teaches us humility like having messed things up. And Paul here is saying, yeah, you were really messed up, and God saved you anyway. The second ingredient that must be present to cultivate a heart of mercy is trust. And the opposite of trust is fear, and nothing will choke the heart of mercy quite as quickly as fear. Whenever we are stuck in a place of fear, we will shut down and close off and go into self-defense mode, and you cannot practice mercy from a mode of constant self-defense, which is why John 3.16 is such a crucial text. God so loved the world that God gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. So whom did God love? Does it say God loved the good people? Does it say God so loved the United States? Does it say God so loved the church? No, it says, I'm not making this up, God so loved the world, the whole broken, violent, divided, hurting world, and God gave the world his only son to lead them into life. Now, we could use this text to turn Jesus into something like a ticket that you use to get into heaven, a ticket you use to get eternal life when you die. But, brothers and sisters, eternal life is a quality of life for which you do not need to wait until you die. Eternal life is a quality of life that we can experience right now. When we believe in Jesus, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, when we stay close to Jesus, Jesus begins to live his life through us. And that means that our hearts are then not left to twist in the wind there will be a steadiness and a vitality and a strength that we see in Jesus and that then is given to us. If we are worrying about how things are going to turn out in the future, if we are worrying about our safety, if we are worrying about whether other people like us, then our hearts are going to close up and we will not be able to extend mercy to others. But when we believe in Jesus, when we stay close to Jesus, then Jesus will live his life 
through us, and we will know that God's love does not abandon us, and then our hearts can open, and we will be free to share mercy with those in our lives. So that it turns out that staying close to Jesus is what holds humility and trust together. Because it can be exhausting trying to remember, okay, I've got to practice humility. Oh, wait, I've got to, I've got to practice trust. Oh, gosh, wait, I've got to practice humility. And on and on and on like that, trying to get it just right. But it turns out that keeping our eyes on Jesus does all of that. Holding Jesus before our minds will yield in us. Keeping our eyes on Jesus will yield in us the humility and trust for which we long, and that means that that will then yield a heart of mercy. Now, before we leave all of this, we may observe that although our texts speak of following Jesus as a way that leads to life, they also issue a sober warning that this way of life is an alternative that is opposed in the world. There are other ways to live, ways that do not practice humility, ways that are not willing to trust, ways that refuse to show mercy. And the texts refer to these as ways of death and as deeds of evil. John says that people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. So we may anticipate that practicing humility and living with trust and showing mercy to those who cross our way those things will bring us into proximity with those who think that these ways of living are absurd and foolish and naive. So when that happens, what should we do? We should practice humility and live with trust and show mercy to those who cross our way. Humility, trust, and mercy are not just practices for when everything is nice and easy. They are not practices suitable, perhaps for a mountain retreat, but that must be discarded when we are back in the push and shove of daily life here in the nation's capital. Humility, trust, and mercy are what eternal life looks like. They are what eternal life will look like after we die, and they are what eternal life looks like in the here and now. The letter of Ephesians says that's what God has made us for, created in Christ Jesus our Lord for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. To God and to God alone be all of the glory now and always. Amen. Friends, let us pray. We live in a world of fear where there is hostility and meanness, bullying, anxiety, and our world does not much encourage us towards humility, trust, and mercy. Our world tells us we got to look out for ourselves and watch out for everybody else. And so, oh God, we give you thanks for Jesus, who shows us that there is a better way, a better path, a path that leads to life and not to death, <coughs> path in which eternal life is available right now, a path that is found in him. 
And so we ask in these remaining days of Lent that you would use these remaining days of Lent to draw our hearts and minds to Jesus, that his life may be lived in us and through us, and that we may experience the joy and share the joy that comes from him. In his name we pray. Amen.